Today's reading is from Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 to 14, and can be found on page 892 of the Church Bible. Daniel's dream of four beasts. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind as he was lying on his bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion. It had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a man, and the heart of a man was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back, it had four wings like those of a bird. The beast had four heads and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot wherever it was led. It was different from the former beasts, and it had 10 horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and the three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I looked, it said, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair on his head was as white like wool. His, flaming, sorry, his throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. I, then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision that at night, I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you. Let's pray as we come to consider this Old Testament passage. Father God, we ask this morning that you would be at work in us by your spirit. You'd open our eyes to the truth of your word. Help us to take hold of that, to let go of all else. Help us to have your word take root in our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I was really annoyed this morning. Getting ready to come out, to come over here, uh, and to get stuck into our worship this morning and our service here. And I happened to make a rare visit to the kitchen in our house. 
uh, and Mags was already busy at work there um, making lunch. But as I walked through the kitchen, I found myself singing some lyrics to a song that was playing on the radio. And uh, it was, snow is falling all around us. Children singing, having fun. And I found myself singing along to Shaking Stevens' well-known Christmas song. And it's the 27th of November. The 27th of November and Shaking Stevens is on the radio. And that pales into insignificance alongside the thing that is called, as Elizabeth reminded me this morning as I came in, Whamageddon, where uh, there's a thing up to do with Last Christmas by Wham and when it plays, if it plays after the 1st of December. Is that right? Any of you heard of that? Well, look it up. Not now, obviously, because you're listening intently to me. Don't look it up now. But uh, look it up later. Whamageddon. Christmas comes earlier and earlier, doesn't it? I mean, I, I, stuff's been in the shops for a lot, a lot, a, for a long time now, a lot earlier than that. And uh, what our reading from Daniel does for us today is, I mean, because we're all, it, it just, I mean, it sucks you in, like me just singing those lyrics. I didn't even realise I'd moved into singing that awful Christmas song. But you just, you're just sucked in. And so we're in this period of time now where we're just sucked in to doing Christmas. And it's not Christmas yet. We're around the shops and the tunes are playing. Oh, that looks nice as you walk past the Christmas display in whatever supermarket you happen to be in. Oh, yes, I really need a clay pot filled with Stilton rank cheese. Um, because, that's, because that's what you get at Christmas. Um, oh, <laughs> all of a sudden, things that you'd never touch with a barge pole are good ideas because you're sucked into it. And the whole thing starts to happen. And we start to get the whole Christmas thing happening early. And it bugs the life out of me. I mean, I, you know, talk to anybody in my family. They, they call me the Christmas Grinch. Um, you know, I, me and my sister-in-law are brothers in arms in this. I hate Christmas. Um, apart from the proper bit of Christmas. It, I don't like the trappings of Christmas, but we're getting sucked into the tinsel, the presents, the preparations. All I mean, preparations need to happen, otherwise I'm not going to get my present. But, you know, <laughs> it's, it's easy to get sucked into Christmas too soon and miss the point of the season that we're in. And this reading from Daniel takes us to the reason for the season that we're in and beyond. This reading from Daniel takes us to the big picture of God. You see, the, the Christmas thing, uh, I've even advertised it this morning, asking for people to have tea towels on their heads and things for our Bethlehem village event here in the church. You know, the, uh, the Christmas story, the, the wonderful, lovely thing, you know, Mary and Joseph off to Bethlehem, the star, the angels, woo, all that kind of thing is there. But it's only a part of the story. It's a crucial part of the story. But it's only part of the story. And we, we need to make sure that we always hold the big picture of what God is doing, even in that thing, even in that crucial thing. As we come to celebrate it, we've got to hold in our minds the big picture story that's going on behind all of that. And Daniel's reading here on the first Sunday of Advent, which isn't Christmas, it's Advent. It's a, it's a time of preparation. It's a time of thinking about what's gone before and a time of thinking about what's going to come. It's a big picture season, looking back and looking forward. And Daniel takes us right there. But we need to, we need to also remember as we approach Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, uh, that we need to adopt the same approach to Daniel's writing in this chapter and others in Daniel, but this one that we're looking at today, as we did when we were looking at Revelation at the beginning of the year, which feels about five minutes ago. We've got to recognize that the style of writing that is before us, it's the, the apoc apocalyptic, the prophetic, uh, all that sort of incredible imagery which paints pictures of destruction with, you know, lions with ribs between its teeth and wings being ripped off, uh, all that kind of gory imagery. We've got to assume, like we did with Revelation, we've got to handle it with care. We've got to assume that it's not a literal description of everything. This is actually prophetic, powerful imagery. And we've got to look, I think, to the big story rather than the detail. The big story speaks more powerfully than the, the, the detail in so many ways. I'll refer to the detail in passing, but I want us to focus on 
the two key characters in that passage that we've had read this morning that help us hold the big picture so helpfully, so clearly. And that the two figures are the Ancient of Days and the one like a son of man. They take us above the story that we're all being sucked into as we head towards Christmas. The scene in David is one of the end times. It starts out with Daniel seeing four great beasts. Again, this is language, so isn't it? So similar to what we encountered in Revelation. Each of those beasts representing a world empire, those nations which would reign over Israel, often cruelly. Uh, but as the vision progresses and we move from beasts through to horns and then a small horn that comes up between them, we're, we're seeing God's everlasting, indestructible kingdom arrive and conquer them all. The big picture is bad stuff's going to happen, but God's everlasting kingdom is going to win out. God's everlasting king will rule forever. When God first appears, in verse 9 of chapter 7, we're told thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. Thrones were set in place, multiple, plural. There was more than one throne, maybe two. Why have more than one throne? God is the one who is on the throne. Why do we need another one? Well, that becomes clear as the other character arrives in a little while. But then comes this description of God, and with that, a unique title. This is, you know, one of the most detailed descriptions of God that we find in the whole Bible. We're still left with a lot of unanswered questions, but God is described here. It says that his clothing was as white as snow. It doesn't say anything about what kind of clothing it is. Maybe some people would immediately jump to sort of flowing robes like people wear in all the Jesus films that you see. My mind went straight to Morgan Freeman and Bruce Almighty and his sharp suit that was white. But no, none of that matters, really. This is, this is an attempt by, human, by a human being using human words to describe the indescribable, to describe what can't be put into words. It will always fall short. You know, God's hair is said to be white like wool, which is exactly the way it's described in Revelation chapter 1. But he is described as the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days. And when I hear that, I think of someone who's old beyond imagining. Someone who's always been and always will be. It's a phrase that captures something of the, the, the magnitude of God, the ancient of days. Uh, it's hard for our human brains to grasp the idea of, of a God who is eternal, who has no beginning, who has no end, who's always been there and who always will be there. The ancient of days maybe helps us to do that, but maybe not even as much as John does at the beginning of his gospel, the ancient of days, who, who isn't constrained by time. Instead, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. This is the God that we worship. Time's up. Last orders, please, ladies and gentlemen. Who put that booby trap there? <laughs> Don't make me laugh mid-flow. Not allowed. John gives us a handle on the eternity of God. He was there at the beginning. Everything was made by him and through him. He's the ancient of days. And we move from God to his throne. God's throne is blazing, we're told in verse 9. The throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. I can't, you know, I can't help but think, I'm, sorry, I'm in a bit of a flippant mood this morning, but I, I can't help but think of God's throne on wheels. And I, it reminds me of a, a session that we had in here when Chris and I used to run um, ID on a Sunday night. And we played human curling with, with, with the youngsters. So we, 
we put them first of all on office chairs and we set targets at the end of the extension and we would throw them down the extension to see who would score most points by where the chair landed. But at one point we got three of them on one of those silver catering trolleys. One on each layer and we threw, I've just remembered this is being live streamed. <laughs> we didn't do that at all. I'm just making that up. Um, just a flippant idea in my mind about, you know, people pushing God's throne around and him enjoying himself. Um, I, think, I think the wheels on the throne represent God's ability to be anywhere, anytime, to do that, that sort of omnipresence, that, that ability of God to, to be God, being God in all places at all times. And the fire that flows, that comes out before him, um, that's also mentioned in Psalm 50 verses three to four um but it's to do with judgment and remembering that the god who sits on the throne who can be everywhere all the time who is eternal and beyond our imaginings in relation to time is also the judge the judge of all verses three to four of psalm 50 he summons the heavens above and the earth that he may judge his people gather to me my created ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice this is the, the, the fire of judgment comes from God because he is a judge and I've said this in sermons before very recently we lose sight of that at our peril we must remember that our God is a God of love is the God who loves us each and every one of us he's redeemed us through his son but he is also our judge we will be called to stand before him and give an account such an important aspect of God. As we come to understand who God is and understand who he is and what his purposes are, we can never let go of the fact that he is our judge amongst all the other things that he is to us. And the picture of fire, the cleansing fire that will devour all before it is a cleansing fire. The prejudgment cleanses. beyond our limited understanding of time. He's beyond our limited understanding of physical limitations. He's also beyond our limited understanding of holiness. God is holy. And because he's holy, he will judge. And then we find around God's throne, we find people standing before him. And the number of people that are before him, are my, it's a mind-boggling number. I've never been very good at math, so I'm not going to do it. But it must, if you did all that multiplication, it must result in millions of people standing before the throne of God. And then we're told that that court is seated. And as they seat, whoever they are, we're not told who the court is made up of. But when they sit, books are opened. And again, this scripture doesn't say anything about what those books are and what's in them. But our minds probably you know, jump immediately to the book of life where names are written in of those who are going to be saved, God's people who are going to be with him forever. And those books are open. And as those books are open, we launch into another bit about the beast, and I'll come to that in a moment. But around God's throne, we have all that going on. We have God's throne like it is. We have God like he is. And Daniel reveals to us in a big picture way if ever you want to know who God is, come to Daniel and read this passage again. Have a look at who our sovereign God is who sits on the throne. He is sovereign. He is the ruler on his throne. He is the judge of humanity. He's eternal. He's no beginning and no end. He's all powerful. He's omnipresent. God himself is there, the ancient of days. And if we want to understand something of him, who he is and what he's about, then look here. Spend some time in Advent looking here to understand who our God is. Let that fill in the detail of the big picture that sits behind the story that we're all getting sucked into right now. Why did Jesus need to come? Because God is our judge and because God loves us and is just. Why did Jesus come? something to do with who God is. And that unfolds further as we move past this bit of the reading. But 
see the beauty and awe, the inspiring nature of God. Don't have a small, I can put him in a box view of our sovereign God. Allow Daniel to expand your understanding of who he is, to let your mind drift into what it might mean for God to be eternal, what it might mean for God to be just, what it might mean for God to be everywhere all of the time, what that makes possible. Let Daniel paint you a picture of God. Let him, let, let, let him be seen to be ruling and worship him. The God that's described here is a God worthy of our worship. Worthy of our lives being given to him. So that's the ancient of days. And before we get to the next character, we see the culmination, if you like, of the story of the beasts that have been described. After very tumultuous times in those opening verses of chapter 7, the final beast, the horn, is destroyed completely and the others are stripped of their authority by the one who sits on the throne. Verses in 11, 11 and 12 we're looking at here. And there's no doubt left about that final horn that was so dangerous. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts were stripped of their authority, allowed to live for a period of time, but they too are destroyed. All the things that cause the discord, the disharmony, the tumult, the violence in the world are destroyed by this God who sits on the throne. And that little piece of information is sandwiched between the Ancient of Days and the one like Son of Man. Because in verse 13, Daniel tells us, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. The one who sits on the throne has destroyed those other empires and rulers. He causes the world and the influence of the beast to crumble, and it's replaced by a new kind of kingdom ushered in by this new character, this one like the son, son of man, and a character who helps fill our understanding of who our God is. Does that phrase, one like a son of man, sound familiar? It was one of the ways Jesus referred to himself. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 20, Jesus says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Jesus referred to himself as the son of man, taking hold of that image that Daniel presents us with for himself. Coupled with this is the idea that when he comes back, as Jesus has promised he will do, Jesus says in Matthew 26, verse 64, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the, the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Stack those words up against what Daniel's vision contained. There was more than one throne. In the future, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Luke 21, verse 7. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud in power and great glory. And at John 1, 51, Jesus tells his disciples, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And then at Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, look, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. One like a son of man referred to in Daniel points forward to Jesus. The clouds of heaven portray the son of man as divine. And throughout the Bible, clouds, clouds have always represented God's majesty and awesome presence. If you want to go into that in depth, dive into Exodus. Have a look in Exodus and, and read there of the role of the clouds in relation to the divine presence. But Exodus chapter 16 and verse 10, while Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked towards the desert and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. So when we read of the Son of Man coming in a cloud, we know that all the glory of God surrounds him. We know that who we're talking about is divine. He is God himself. The 
one like a son of man in Daniel's vision. He's the one promised. He's the Messiah. He's the king, God's king, coming on the clouds for our benefit, for our redemption, out of love for each and every one of us. And notice here in this reading too, that the son of man gets led to the throne room. He's immediately led into God's presence. There's no question. I mean, normally in the Old Testament, if someone's being led into the presence of God, they fall on their face in fear of where they're going. They fear for their lives. Being in the presence of God would have meant the end of them because a a wretched sinner in the presence of the holy and righteous God, they could have no other consequence. One like a son of man is led straight into his presence. And in his presence, incredible things are given to him. He's given authority, glory, sovereign power over all people everywhere. The Ancient of Days conveys all this upon him. All nations and people of every language are going to worship this person, this one like the Son of Man. They're all going to worship him. What? An Old Testament text that has God sat on the throne, but the one next to him is going to be the one who is worshipped. You say, why? Mind-blowing stuff. Worship is only due to God. Why worship this one? Well, because... He is God. All kings will bow down to him and nations will serve him, we're told in uh, Psalm 72, verse 11. The Messiah's dominion is going to last forever. It will never pass away, we're told in this passage of Daniel. His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed, right at the end of that reading, verse 14. The one, like a, the one like a son of man is unique, he's special, he's given so much, and eventually only his kingdom will last. All those others that have caused so much trouble, that have torn the world apart, seen such violence and chaos, all gone. The only kingdom that's left is the kingdom that has been given and belongs to and is ruled over by one like a son of man. God's chosen king, the one upon whom God has given all authority, all time. And those who follow the king will be part of this unshakable kingdom. We can take comfort from these verses, even though they're tied up with violence and discord in the first half of that that chapter. We can take comfort because of where they land. They land in the purposes of God, being the creator God, bringing all things to perfection through one like a son of man, bringing all things to an everlasting conclusion, an everlasting conclusion that we can be a part of as we come and worship him as those who come from all people's nations and men of every language, and we worship him. No matter what happens here on earth, no matter what, whether it's a cost of living crisis, whether it's a war in Ukraine, whether it's a world war or a holocaust, no matter what, no matter how horrific those things are, we know our future is built on an unshakable, solid foundation that cannot be destroyed. And that's revealed here by Daniel. It comes to us through the Ancient of Days and it's made real and brought to fruition by one like a son of man. Daniel couldn't name him, but we can. Keep the Ali's sermon from a few weeks back, where the Old Testament references couldn't name who this person was. Daniel couldn't name him, but we can. Daniel couldn't see him fully, but we can. And so here in the Old Testament, Jesus is revealed in his might, in his power, in his majesty. God's purposes are revealed. Um, not just for what's going to happen here on earth, but what stands either side of that in eternity. From the very beginning to the very end, God is on his throne. From the very beginning to the very end, his purpose was to restore the chaotic world through one who he would invite onto a throne next to him, his son, one like a son of man. (coughs) We take comfort from that. We root our hope in that. And we approach Christmas 
through the season of Advent with that big picture in our mind. That God, through Jesus, is putting all things right. That's what we need to remember and hold on to. That's what needs to fuel our understanding of what we reflect on through Advent, but also what we reflect on as we come to Christmas. That was just one step in the purposes of God to bring to fruition all that we're doing. Our God isn't just a distant judge who sits on a throne of fire. He's one like us who comes to us, who brings victory through the most unusual ways and holds us in that victory forever. And so we're now in Advent. Let's head through the tinsel, the presents, the food preparation and the celebration of Jesus' birth. Uh, and and, and let's, let's be captivated again by all of that, that incredible story of a virgin giving birth to a saviour. Let's put up the trees and let's buy presents. But as we do all that, keep your eyes fixed. Keep your eyes fixed on the big picture, in, on the ancient of days, bringing an end to the, dom the dominance of evil and suffering and the battle against principalities and powers. And notice that heading that battle, it's been going on, is one like a son of man, who is God incarnate, the Messiah, who will willingly go to the cross and to the tomb to make that final victory described by Daniel then possible. <coughs> Never lose sight of those two characters. Never lose sight of their eternal purpose and their victory. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, ancient of days, thank you that you have always been and you always will be. Thank you in the context of eternity that you care about us. One like a son of man to rescue us from ourselves, to redeem us. And through him, you lead us with him to the fruition of history. And the bringing together of all things where your kingdom will last forever with him on the throne. Help us to hold on to these eternal truths, we pray. In his powerful name, one like a son of man. Our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.